Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today to learn more about America's public gardens and their increasing efforts to lead food security resilience. My name is Sarah Jandua, and I am a consultant with Agritecture, and I'm also a board member of the NYC Agriculture Collective. Really quickly about those two organizations, Agritecture is the world's leading advisory firm on urban and controlled environment agriculture. We work with clients of all types, from entrepreneurs and investors, to city governments and technology providers, and to date have completed more than 150 projects in over 35 countries. And as for the NYC Agriculture Collective, that is a nonprofit organization dedicated to the progressive, the promotion of progressive urban agriculture and ag tech initiatives, um, as well as food equity and education in New York City. Today, we're going to be having a discussion on impact beyond the gates, leading food security resilience through America's public gardens. We'll be hearing from a panel of public garden leaders on how public gardens across the United States are rapidly evolving to incorporate urban agriculture and food security initiatives into their programs. And on that note, I would like to introduce Amber Herzer, who will be co-moderating this panel. Amber? Thank you so much, Sarah. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're so glad you're here. Um, my name is Amber Herzer. I am an avid gardener and a member of the American Public Gardens Association. Um, I also serve as the head of program management at Bowery Farming, which is the country's largest vertical farming company. Um, every day we build smart indoor farms close to the cities that we serve, um, and we grow fresh, flavorful, safe, and sustainable um, food uh, 365 days a year. Today I am very excited to bring together my passion for public gardens with agriculture. So I'm um, excited to introduce our panel today. And um, I'm going to ask each of them to say a little bit about themselves and their professional backgrounds, as well as an overview of um, their institutions, agricultural and food security programs. Um, so we're going to kick off right now today with uh, Brian. So Brian Vogt from the Denver Botanic Garden, if you'll get us started. Good afternoon. It's so fun to be here. This is a powerful topic and it's wonderful to see it catching so much uh, attention and energy. Uh, Brian Vogt, I'm with uh, Denver Botanic Gardens. We're um, uh, kind of a unique organization. I've been here 14 and a half years, and currently we have five sites that we manage, and uh, we are expanding in a lot of community outreach. Our, our largest site is actually called Chatfield Farms, which is uh, a historic um, pair of farms, one a ranch, one a farm, uh, southwest of Metro Denver. And so we, we've been trying to find the right voice for that uh, piece of property for a long time. We are uh, developing a new master development plan, but the whole point of it now is uh, riparian and prairie restoration coupled with sustainable agriculture. So we've been uh, dealing in a whole number of different agricultural spaces over the last 10 years and are really ramping it up. Um, with, we started out with uh, uh, Le Potager Garden, uh, uh, aesthetically pleasing kitchen garden. Then our big farms down at Chatfield, uh, then a CSA, then market gardens, then outreach to um, housing authorities. Um, food is really essential to what we do. Excellent. Thank you so much, Brian, for sharing. And um, up next, we'll have Ursula from the New York Botanical Garden. Hi, good afternoon. So I'm Ursula Chance. I'm the director of Bronx Greenup and Community Horticulture at the New York Botanical Garden. And Bronx Greenup is the community garden outreach program in the New York Botanical Garden. Um, what we do is we provide horticulture advice, technical assistance and training to community gardeners, school gardeners, urban farmers, really um, anyone from the public who's interested in, in greening and food growing initiatives in the Bronx primarily is where we focus. And we have a workshop series that we provide. We have a certificate series that focuses on pruning, which includes fruit trees, also uh, organic vegetable garden course, also one on improving your soils. Um, we also have our sister's program, New York City Compost Project, hosted by the New York Botanical Garden, which is part of the citywide compost project, New York City Compost Project, hosted and funded by the Department of Sanitation. And um, yeah, so that's just a quick overview of of our programs, our community garden outreach programs. And then we work closely with Edible Academy, which is the children's 
program here at the Botanical Garden on a three acre site that also focuses on um, food growing and culinary aspects um, and, and different children education programs. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. And as a New Yorker, I very much enjoy the New York Botanic Garden. Um, I thank you. So next I'm gonna move on to Kelly. Um, Kelly is from the Chicago Botanic Garden. If you wanna share a little bit about yourself and the great work you're doing. Everyone, uh, hello. I'm Senior Operations Director for Windy City Harvest, which is a department of the Chicago Botanic Garden. Um, it's our urban agriculture department. Um, we have around 15 farms in the city of Chicago, uh, where we focus on um, kind of a continuum or web of training opportunities that can start with um, our youth. We actually got started with youth farming around 20 years ago. Um, and so we hire high school students for summer jobs on the farms. Um, we run a re-entry program. So we work with returning citizens who've been involved in the justice system, sometimes veterans as well, um, for a uh, paid on the job training opportunity on the farms. Um, we also run an apprenticeship with uh, the city colleges of Chicago that's accredited um, for around 20 individuals a year that go through that in a cohort, which is much more hands-on um, trades based. And then we um, offer a farmer incubator program um, where graduates can run their own farm businesses. Um, and then we run some more like kind of community engagement programs, such as a Veggie RX prescription produce program as kind of a market channel for farmers, um, as well as uh, we've been incorporating therapeutic horticulture into our department more, more recently, as well as um, community gardening. So we have around 100 families that we support, you know, um, their own gardening efforts and offer kind of like workshops um, and some of that therapeutic horticulture with. So a little bit about Windy City Harvest. Thank you. Excited to be here. Yeah, thank you, Kelly, for joining us. Um, and last but not least, uh, we have Ari from the San Diego Botanic Garden. Hi, I'm so pleased to be here. For me, it's still morning, so good morning and afternoon to everybody. Um, here, I'm the president and CEO at San Diego Botanic Garden. I'm also a researcher. I hold a research appointment at the Salk Institute of Biological Studies. And um, San Diego Botanic Garden is a 37-acre botanic garden in Encinitas, California, just north um, of, of San Diego. Uh, we're very close to the coast and it's a really lovely place so I encourage you all to come visit. Um, we have a variety of programs um, and, uh, and efforts that, that, that interface with um, agriculture and urban agriculture in a variety of ways. We have priority collections. We house um, one of the main um, subtropical fruit collections uh, within the United States uh, and one of the few that's, that's open to the public. And so we're an important resource for teaching the people of Southern California and other regions about some of the, the, the fruits they can grow that grow really well and don't require a whole lot of inputs, but maybe aren't being used that much yet. Um, we also do a lot of work with partners. I know we're gonna talk about partners later, but we're, we're really fortunate to be located next to an urban uh, uh, nonprofit farm called Coastal Roots Farm. And so we, we get to let them focus on the farming and we um, support with our knowledge of plant diversity. And I'll, I'll be happy to talk about that a little bit more. Um, and then also we do a fair amount of research um, that relates to agriculture. One of our um, head, head, head scientists here, Colin Corey, is one of the main scientists throughout the world working on what we call crop wild relatives. Um, these are the species of, of plants that are often housed in botanic gardens that are closely related to our major crop species and even our minor crop species and, and, ha and have a lot of the genetic um, attributes, disease resistance, abiotic stress tolerance, um, and other things that are really needed um, for us to adapt both urban and other forms of agriculture to our changing climate. Excellent, thank you, Ari. And I'm gonna pass it to Sarah and we'll get our discussion going. Great, thank you so much everyone for taking the time to introduce yourselves and your organizations and a brief highlight of all of your programs. Um, before we dive deeper into ongoing programmatic efforts and partnerships and things like that, Ari, it would be great given your extensive knowledge and expertise, if you could give our audience a bit of an overview on how the public garden sector has evolved. Because I thought, I think I read somewhere that um, 
More recently, public gardens were not as focused on food security and urban agriculture. So it'd be great if you could speak to that a little bit. Thank you. Sure. I'm going to keep it short. I'm one of my, I, I like to write and I write, I've written a, a bit about the history of botanic gardens um, and public gardens and their engagement in agriculture. And I think it's important to say when we say public garden, we really mean a, it's a very big net, a lot of institutions. It's really any garden you can go to as a member of the public and, and enjoy what they have to offer. And it's, I think, important to start at the beginning. And gardens uh, you know, are central to the placemaking mythology, uh, religious and spiritual understandings of really you know, almost every world um, culture. Um, in, in Judeo-Christianity, of course, you know, we have, we come from the Garden of Eden. I mean, that's a garden. Um, in, in Norse mythology, you know, Idrisil, the tree of life, gives birth to the entire universe. And so gardens and plants are really at the center of, of who we are. And, and that cultural understanding comes from, of course, the practical recognition that plants are the primary um, form of life on this planet that nourish us, that provide us with the food that we eat and the air that we breathe in a, in a direct sense. Um, and so gardens, uh, we think of the sort of modern history of gardens, at least botanic gardens, beginning in the Renaissance, when the first um, uh, systematized collections of plants came together for study and learning. And those, those collections were originally medicinal, um, and they quickly began to grow, and, and certainly by the 17 and 1800s, you actually see an incredibly robust engagement of um, botanic and other uh, public gardens at the time engaged in, in agriculture. But what happened was really in the late 19th century and early 20th century, gardens sort of uh, refocused more on plant biodiversity and other institutions kind of picked up um, sort of agricultural innovation and, and extension and things like that. In the United States, we had you know, our, our U.S. Department of Agriculture, um, you know, which drove a, a whole bunch of stuff that, that began in the 1860s and extension services, which are, you know, funded mainly by the feds, but housed in um, most of the land grant state universities. You know, they sort of took over that role that, that, that gardens had played previously. But what we've had in the last you know, few decades and, and some of the institutions here, um, you know, certainly Chicago Botanic Garden um, and, and others, you know, been doing it for so long. Our, our gardens kind of coming back, you know, I almost think of them coming back home, you know, getting back into agriculture after maybe, you know, some, some decades of not being as engaged. And it's really exciting because in addition to a refocus on this area of, of agricultural um, engagement, there's also been a, a refocusing in, in the garden sector on, um, on really community enhancement and social justice and equity and equality. Um, and so those things have come together so well by all the institutions that are, that are represented here where these urban agriculture initiatives and other agriculture initiatives come together to not only you know, teach about plants and use the, the specific plant-based and horticultural-based knowledge that, that gardens have to bring to the public, but really make sure we're bringing them to the communities that, that you know, we, we had maybe haven't served so well in the past and certainly could use that information and knowledge today. So it's an exciting time and a rich time of great innovation. And this is, I'm honored to be on this panel because we have so many real leaders in this area here now. Excellent. Thank you so much, Ari, for sharing that. And I think to that, um, using that as a, a foundation, um, I'm interested in hearing from Brian and Kelly and Ursula around what does agriculture and food security, why, why, why does agriculture and food security matter to your institutions? And how has that vision kind of evolved over the years as um, Ari indicated? Well, I, I, I think it's interesting. First of all, I loved how Ari described that, especially starting out with that very poetic beginning about the, the foundation of culture being embedded in gardens. Thank you for that. That was great. Um, I, I remember back um, a couple of years into my time at Denver Tenney Gardens, we had uh, classrooms uh, full of kids that had poured out of school buses and they were doing projects throughout the gardens. And I was over hearing one of the presentations and one of the uh, teachers had a group of uh, probably first or second graders and said, um, how many of you had plants for breakfast this morning? And nobody raised their hand. And then she said, well, what'd you have? And they said, we had cereal and we had uh, a banana or a toast or, you know, everything was a plant. And, and I think that that was one of the real sparks for me is that this is such an elemental relationship of human beings to the plant world. The, the foundation of our food source in, in plants, um, but we've somehow fractured that connection in our modern society. Um, we don't really understand where food comes from anymore. People have a, a vague idea, but it's still pretty shocking for a lot of kids when they find out the, the hard uh, truth of it all. 
So in a botanic garden, our job is to amplify those relationships between human beings and plants so that there is that protective sense of connection. And food is such a, an obvious way to start. Um, and then you go through all the different ways that you can uh, carry that out, uh, whether it's outreach efforts like we do uh, markets out in, uh, in places that are food insecure right now. Um, we have a, a veterans to farmers program where we've trained over 100 vets. We give them stipends. They spend two days a week on our farms, uh, learn how to grow food. Uh, they do a project and at the end of their, their session that takes about four months, they have a project they present and we've had some amazing projects come out of that. Most of them have gone into farming themselves, either owning their own farm or working at a farm. So a lot of those are obvious ways, but there's something really deep about this, and that is uh, the protection of soils. Um, soil destruction has been a leading cause of the downfall of civilization since the dawn of time, where we've over depleted them. We've, in, in our case, we've dumped too many chemicals. Uh, we've turned them over too many times. We haven't been thinking about long-term health. Uh, we're looking at a time where at least in my part of the world, Sorry, Southwest United States, we don't have very much water in Colorado right now. In fact, over the last week, um, Hawaii has surpassed us as having more snow than Colorado has had so far this year, which is kind of a shocker when you think about it. So when you're looking at that, um, soils are even more precious. And so how do we relate to those things like uh, crop wild relatives to find varieties that use less water that are highly productive? This is all urgent stuff. And so for a botanic garden that wants to be an activist garden, food is really essential. And it's essential, obviously, to life as we know it. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate um, Kelly and Ursula, do you have interested in hearing how your gardens have also evolved thinking about this topic with the deep urgency that Brian has laid out here for us? Sure, I can go ahead. Um, so what the New York Botanical Garden has, I guess, you know, talking about children has been committed to creating an opportunity for children to learn about growing food on the garden grounds, like really since the 1950s, which is when NYBG created the Children's Garden Program. And then since then it's grown and expanded to include school groups and family programs. And it's now housed at Edible Academy, which is a three acre site at NYBG. And then Bronx Green Up, our community garden outreach program was created in 1988. And that was just to assist our neighbors in the Bronx, like residents who stayed in the Bronx. And we're doing the tremendous work of cleaning out garbage room, vacant lots to create beauty and nurture health and bring the community together. And it, you know, those were completely community driven efforts. And so it made sense the botanical garden located in the Bronx would share its expertise and resources with these efforts that were happening. And then over our history, Bronx Greenups has assisted with the creation of more than 300 community gardens, school gardens, and urban farms in the Bronx. And we have a network of about 200 community gardens, school gardens, and urban farms that we work with. And then it's especially been really compelling to me how our two programs, Edible Academy and Bronx Greenup, have come together um, since the start of the pandemic and have been just, um, you know, trying to figure out how we can best support the the community and really um, to increase community food production and then also um, with food distribution to getting fresh food to the community. And so that really has been through the Bronx Community Farm Hubs and that's a collective network that's made up of a core group of about 18 neighborhood gardens and urban farms spread out over the Bronx as well as Edible Academy. And this network, it's, it, it came together because it was at the start of the pandemic and crisis in New York City. And we spoke to our longtime community garden and urban farm leaders about what we could do together during this critical time. And we knew that Bronx residents, residents already face so many challenges. Um, it's one of the areas with one of the highest rates of food insecurity in the nation. And we knew that this would only be exacerbated by the pandemic. So the result was like this network, which was supporting and helping coordinate the gardens and farms to increase food productions, to then distribute through their neighborhoods through the Bronx Community Farm Homes. And so it started in 2020, it, it continued the season through 2021, and we're looking through 2022, just seeing how we can continue to, to work together. So that just kind of, you know, kind of a brief, 
shot of like the evolution of how the garden's relationship with urban agriculture and food security. And deep roots to the community, which I think are really critical as a, a partnership between the garden and the community and how those needs have evolved over time. Which I think is actually a similar sort of story to what's happened in Chicago. So it's a good um, segue to Kelly to provide us sort of how did your garden get involved with agriculture and urban ag and evolve over time um, and as a, as a priority for the garden. Yeah, beautiful um, intro, Ari. Thank you, Brian, Ursula. I mean, you've covered so many things. So I'll try not to be too redundant. The um, Chicago Botanic Garden, we're up on our 50th anniversary of having a physical home, um, but it's hard to, to not talk about the physical home without talking about just, as Ari mentioned, the evolution, which really started as a, um, a horticultural society around 100 years ago, um, housed in the city center, um, where there was a lot of focus at that time more on um, agriculture. And then as Victory Gardens came on later on, there was a lot of involvement. Um, but my personal department, the uh, Windy City Harvest Department, started as a community gardening department around 50 years ago when the physical campus was built, which is, I would also say, the other kind of um, way that our programs have evolved is just because the physical campus is on the most northern part of our county, um, which is um, the uh, land that our garden is based on, which is like a forest preserve here, which uh, the Cook County Forest Preserve. Um, so one of the things that we did as a community gardening department was we would do kind of like outreach. So we would go build school gardens. Um, and as time went on, it was very clear from our partners that there was a need for many of the reasons Ursula just discussed to get more involved. And I think that's around 20 years ago when we really started challenging ourselves, we learned from the Boston Food Project um, about um, their programming and really started looking at this idea of the um, job training, workforce development. Um, and I think the evolution now is a, more about access because we kind of look at it as there's the main campus, you know, in um, Glencoe, which is pretty far removed. I mean, most of our um, participants in our programs with Windy City Harvest, you'll ask if they've ever been to the Botanic Garden and no one has. Um, and so I think this is a way to like bring the Botanic Garden into um, communities that wouldn't um, have that access. And then the programming has evolved uh, to meet the needs um, of our partners and um, participants. So I think the most interesting evolution that really surprised me really is veggie rx this concept of working with health centers it was never part of like our plan as a community gardening department or urban agriculture department but little by little as um, we were farming in the city and trying to kind of look at food access we had worked with WIC clinics and women infant and children and other um programs trying to just get our food um as accessible and affordably priced um as possible, you know, to community residents. And that was kind of an area where we found that many, we were lucky to find out that many of these like federally qualified health centers are looking for the same goals for their patients who are struggling with diet related diseases. So it's this interesting kind of like um, connection that you would never imagine a public garden really being responsible for. Um, but just as Brian mentioned, um, it's, it's so simple, you know, it's food, it brings people together. Um, and people can come to our food hub and see, you know, aquaponics at the same time while they're picking up a prescription. Um, and then they can go shopping and, you know, buy produce from the farm. So that's a little kind of overview of the evolution, but um, no, no strategic plan at any point in time, I would say. Yeah, uh, we'll pass it to Sarah, but I think it shows how these, as these listening to the community is a common theme here, right? When you're listening to the needs of the community and growing, with them and um, how that evolves over time. So I'll pass it to you now, Sarah. Great. Um, I want to dive into a question that might be a little more technical. Um, so Ursula and Ari, we would love to hear, you know, East Coast, West Coast, how are the unique needs of climate in your local communities considered when you're designing your urban agriculture programs? I guess I can go first. Um, so, I mean, as Brian sort of alluded to a little earlier in the Southwest, I mean, you know, water is sort of, you know, that that constantly, conversation constantly on our minds. Um, and, and, you know, we're also a 365 day a year 
you know, growing and farming climate. Um, so you know, the weather here is such that you know, we, we, we farm and garden all, all year round. Um, and so those are two, um, you know, physical elements of the community, right? Natural resource, you know, based elements of the community that are really critical and, and even, even independent of the cultural um, and, and human elements of the community that, that, you know, those just drive, you know, the way in which we, we look at, at growing plants here. Um, so, ir you know, irrigation training is maybe like the single most important thing, um, you know, that, that happens. Um, ir water is very expensive here for everybody. Um, you know, ag water pricing here is like, Two percent less than regular water pricing. It's not. It's not a huge cost savings, and the quality of our water is very poor. Um, you know, for for the growth of plants, it, it's sort of full of um, of salts and electrolytes. It's it's safe and healthy for humans to drink, but it causes a lot of challenges for plant physiology. And so, dealing with those technical issues um, and finding ways to educate people, you know, wherever they are, you know, whether it's that 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 first time tomato. You know, um, gardener at home who is growing plants for the first time in pots or, you know, um, a community garden situation where they, they're, they're doing a lot more um, complicated technical um, farming, um, you know, we, we have to find our ways of, of being able to do that. And then when you layer on top of that, you know, the, the many cultures and communities that we have, you know, that we are a nation of immigrants um, and, you know, we, we have, you know, long established populations, um, it, it, we have uh, populations that are new to the United States and our region, and they all bring with them, you know, their values and, and, and diversity of foods that they want to grow that mean a lot to them. And, you know, it's really rich and, and, and exciting. And, uh, and we get to do a lot of that. And I, I mentioned our subtropical fruit garden earlier. That's a really important you know, part of what we do because we're growing a lot of the, the, the trees that, that are native to, you know, here and adjacent Mexico that are really important um, uh, plants. Um, uh, like sapotes, for example, that most people haven't heard of unless you live near a sapote tree. Um, but, uh, but, but also there's all kinds of stuff from all over the world. Pomegranates are great for our, our, our climate and they are really important plants for certain cultural backgrounds. Um, so that's just sort of one area where the sort of technical and, and, the, and the nitty gritty around the cultural kind of comes together around how we think about our community and our environment. Thank you so much for that. Um, Ursula, we would love to hear more about um, this in regards to New York City. Sure, well, yeah, we're not growing pomegranates. <laughs> we're kind of winding down for the season, but it is like, I mean, that is something that we look at. It's just like how we can extend the season. So there's definitely like a lot more being done with like hoop houses and, you know, even on the farmhouse called stones, like I have a greenhouse. If anyone has something they want to overwinter, you can bring it here or you, you can bring, you know, so just like trying to share those resources, but also understanding that we do, we do have winter, although, you know, it's changing. It hasn't been as cold as it has been in the past and we'll see what this season is like. But, um, but one way just to think about it is just like with the, um, the farmhouse looking at like how we distributed, for example, vegetable starts. So, over the last two seasons with Edwell Academy, they've actually grown um, between 10,000 and 15,000 vegetable seedlings, which we've then been distributed out to the farm hub sites. And so it was looking at like, how can we help the sites that are wanting to grow food increase that food production? And so we were like, okay, why don't we, we can have like the greens that we give out in early April, and then we'll have our warmer season crops that we give out in May to June. And then we can give out another batch, like, you know, later in August, that can be more greens that people can continue growing as, you know, as long as possible. So just, you know, looking at that to see um, ways that we could help them grow the, grow the most food. And then also just, you know, sourcing, you know, like Ari was saying, just looking at like what people want it to grow, what seeds do they want us to source, you know, so different things would come up like Komatsuna or cilantro, or definitely collards are really popular. So just like making sure that we're growing what, what people want to grow and distribute and then also getting seeds to give out. And then, and then garlic, like that's something that um, people really wanted to grow. And so we, that's something that we distribute garlic bulbs in October and people have mostly gotten them in the ground. There's some sites that are still getting them in, but um, just to have that over the winter as well. So that's, you know, example. And then um, in terms, it just in, in terms of water, it rainfall, like more we're dealing with like heavy rains that people are having to figure out how to do with that. Some of the sites have like rainwater harvesting systems or looking at, you know, the more of the severe storms we're getting, trying to see how people can buffer. And I think there, you know, those are just challenges that people are still, you know, in the process of figuring out and we're working with gardeners to, to figure that out as well. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I think um, 
this highlighting of like no water and too much water, right? Like every garden and every community, no matter where you are in the country is struggling with how the climate is affecting those gardens and communities and adapting. And I think there is no one size fits all for an urban garden program, which is I think what we're learning here. Um, and that's uh, to, to Brian and Kelly, we are very interested in uh, what kind of partnerships did you form or have you formed um, to really help expand the impact of your programs um, as you are getting to know your community better and adapting to the needs of your communities? Thank you for that. Uh, it's interesting. Our, our first major partner was a healthcare company, Kaiser Permanente, which did a multi-year sponsorship of the creation of our community supporting agriculture program. And out of that, we started uh, taking excess um, vegetables, uh, first to food banks and then to uh, food insecure sites uh, throughout the metro area with markets that we established. So they were a fantastic uh, partner right off the bat. Um, we then teamed up with Denver Housing Authority and began to, they, they, they were in the process of really rethinking housing developments and making them much more livable, integrated spaces. So it wasn't secluded over here and it looked one way and it was surrounded by neighborhoods that looked a different way. They really wanted it to blend better with the neighborhoods and give people a high quality of life. So we developed a curriculum for growing vegetables in the city and we established a number of raised beds in housing developments. Uh, we just picked up a, another one last year and the residents then come in and they learn how to grow their own vegetables. Uh, the coolest thing about the first uh, project we had was that it was right next to a cafe that was right next to a teaching kitchen. So residents could grow the food and then use the food to learn to cook, to get job skill development for jobs in restaurants. And so it was a really nice uh, overall approach. Uh, Denver Health has also been a big part of our growth. Uh, some of our market sites are connected to healthcare facilities within the area. Uh, veterans to Farmers, I mentioned, were very, very devoted to um, agricultural therapy for vets with PTSD and um, getting them engaged in a process will take them from maybe a state where they're having trouble finding a career or position and putting them into an agricultural uh, mode. Uh, Colorado State University, uh, great partner, Department of Agriculture, the Army Corps of Engineers, we've got a whole bunch of them, a lot of really strong funding sources, uh, private and public funding sources that have stepped up to support this work. And just to put it in perspective, I just wanted to bring up a, an amazing uh, stat that I think a lot of people would find hard to believe, but it's true by at least several sites that I've looked at that during World War II, 40% of all the vegetables consumed in America came from victory gardens. Um, so when you think about that and you think about the the amount of space we have within cities um, and even you know, suburbs and exurbs uh, where we could be growing food um, and then finding ways to share it and multiply our efforts. Um, we, can, we can actually really do something that puts a dent in some of the problems we've got. Thank you, Brian. And I think um, you said Kelly was up next. Yes, interested in Kelly and how your program has evolved um, from a partnerships perspective and the various uh, partners you developed in the community and elsewhere. Yeah, I think um, as a botanic garden, our partnerships really have been interesting. Like we kind of look at it from a land, we start with like looking at our land partners because the um, botanic garden itself and then all of our farms, we don't own any of the land. So that kind of has driven like not only the access and where the farms are, but also just the way the programming um, evolves. So it, um, we work with forest preserves, um, land, the forest preserve here um, in our county, uh, but then also with um, land trusts. Um, we also work with um, which is the Chicago Housing Authority, so kind of similar to as Brian was mentioning on redevelopment of um, public housing lands to incorporate um, our, incub our farmer incubators actually in the middle of um, like a mixed income redevelopment type space where we then also have community gardening plots for residents. So it's and it's kind of a cool site because you have like people who are beginning gardening or maybe returning to gardening. Um, and then, you know, more just for like personal consumption for families, but then there's actually entrepreneur, entrepreneurs um, running their own businesses there. 
Um, and then healthcare partners increasingly um, have been a partner, um, not only for the VEGRX type of angle, but then also for therapeutic horticulture type contracts. Um, and each of the partners kind of do different things um, with how they prescribe some. It's part of an actual prescription that goes through um, you know, a group medical visit. And then others, it's through support, like as Brian mentioned, USDA programs have been really important for us um, along with other, you know, private um, and public funding. Interestingly, our core program, which is our re-entry program, um, partners for that have been um, just HUD, um, is, is one of the most important resources, I think, for doing that type of um, paid on the job training. And then we um, are partnered with, with job partners too. So for example, Gotham Greens is an employment partner. They hire people with backgrounds, they have year round jobs. Um, so that's really been a big push for us as well. Just like looking at how are we doing farmer training and making sure it's diverse enough to include different styles of training so that there's more job readiness and kind of like applicable to that industry as well. Um, and then, as far as sustaining funding, one thing that's been a goal of our department um, is just focusing on um, earned revenues through the produce sales. So we really try to focus on kind of like Brian was mentioning um, and Ursula, like community markets really is our focus, ac affordable, accessible prices, um, taking federal benefits, doubling the value as much as possible through um, programs. But then we pass on markets that are more high end to like our incubators. So if someone comes to us and is like, hey, we would like you to have a farm stand in, um, you know, a certain type of community area where the pricing would be higher here in Chicago that we pass on. Um, so that's been kind of a, just an interesting evolution where we've really stepped away from doing any of that type of um, marketing of our produce. So it's really, I would say more community driven. Um, However, we do focus like all of our farms are working farms that have sales goals. Um, and we find that to be really useful for farmer training just to make it realistic and kind of competitive um, so that participants can be learning about how you would grow for a wholesaler versus how you would grow um, for some of the more community markets. So we do um, every, I think last year we brought in around 40% of our operating budget through earned revenue. So that's something we're really proud of. And a lot of our funders actually challenge us to do. Um, and, um, and I, we're always thinking creatively about it. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'll pass it off to Sarah. Yes, thank you both so much. Um, fortunately, we have time for one final question, which I'm going to pose that's open to any of our panelists to answer before we open up the floor to the audience to ask questions. So something I'm really curious about, um, I find it's, um, I'm just wondering, what are some of the tangible and intangible impacts in the community from your agriculture and food-based programming? And more specifically, how do you, as organizations, measure those successes? I'll give it a shot. Um, <laughs> Some of it's very basic, like uh, uh, the foundation of our, our food system that we created was a CSA, and uh, we've had a wait list now for years. Um, there's almost always 100, 150 people on the wait list. And a funding mechanism that we built into it was that you could buy regular shares or you, you could buy contributing shares, and the contributing shares help support distribution of food to food insecure spaces. So um, people that are receiving our vegetables are helping other people receive the vegetables as well. I think the, the full loop of the system that, and it's been mentioned before, at the markets when people in the community uh, tell you what food they want you to grow um, because it fits into their uh, cooking interests. Um, and then they share recipes and it becomes a whole community event when the markets are open, people are there sharing recipes and uh, bringing up new, new uh, vegetables they want us to, to tackle. That's, that's very much a key to success because it's being owned by the community itself. If we had the raised bed gardens in a housing development and all the plants died because nobody was there to tend them, I would say that would be a failure. Um, but when you see them as a mark of pride for the community and people out there loving the fact that every day they go out there and they tend to their garden, 
um, that's a that's a pretty wonderful feeling. And and for our veterans program, getting a, a, a full cohort of vets involved every single year is just a, a really great stamp of approval. Great. I think now we will open up the discussion for questions from the audience. I see we have one coming in. Um, thank you so much. What plants are most common and easiest to grow in the New York metro area? I, I don't know. I think <laughs> yes, I was just going to say, so, Ursula, I think this is yours, maybe even Amber. <laughs> So what's easy to grow? I mean, definitely I, the greens, I think we've done really well with this year, and especially in terms of like what can produce all season long, like chard and kale and collards. I feel like they're such like we can really count on them to keep growing and producing. Um, and then what else? I mean, people, there's so much that we see that people do well, like different tomatoes, um, peppers, hot peppers. Um, some of our sites have been grown with the Bronx hot sauce project. And so they've been growing serrano peppers in the Bronx for several years now. And those do like extremely well and also produce like all throughout the growing season. Um, Komatsuno is something newer that some of the sites are growing that also grew, grew really well. Um, bok choy we had as well. Um, cucumbers yeah so it's you know it, it depends but definitely i think the greens are pretty they're pretty good to start with um if, if you're trying if starting out with something all right um it looks like another question has come in um someone is curious about the most unusual partnership that has grown from your engagement efforts We'll give everyone a minute to think about that. I don't know that this is an unusual partnership, but I think it's an unusual um, sort of just what happened. So we, I mentioned that we have, we're very fortunate to have an adjacency of, a, of an urban nonprofit farm, um, community farm, Coastal Roots Farm here in Encinitas, California. And um, at one point, a, a couple of years ago, they were looking to activate a, a more intensive food forest space than they, than they had. They were doing mostly sort of standard vegetable production. And uh, in our climate, again, it's very, very strange climate. And they came up with a concept where they thought they wanted uh, bananas to be their, their, their tree crop. Um, and we happened to have a very large banana collection at San Diego Botanic Garden. Um, and so we, we worked with them to trial um, a, a few dozen, I think, banana uh, varieties. And they're currently growing nine different banana varieties as their intercropped um, food forest, um, one of their food forest um, plants in a vegetable production field. And so not exactly an unusual relationship, but I think an unusual outcome. We've got kind of a, a wild one right now, it, right in the core of downtown Denver at the, at the intersection of two major highways, an extremely industrial area, but a spectacular site. Um, we have, we're working with developers that specialize in sustainable communities and they've engaged the, bar the gardens to help them design the garden first and put the community into it second. And with elements like um, low water using uh, plantings, but then a lot of food production, including um, kind of an edible park um, kind of concept. Um, so if that, if that actually gets to the finish line, and I think it will in a few years, it's gonna be an exciting step about urban planning. That's great. Um, do any of our other panelists want to um, speak to that or I can move on to the next question. They're rolling in now. Um, so someone says, thinking of the positive impacts of school-based urban farming programs like Bronx Green Machine, can the panelists describe any personal discoveries of finding the balance between educating and supporting young farmers versus community members learning through their own mistakes. And that was kind of long. If you need to review it, it's in the chat. 
I could just quickly also, I, so before I came out to San Diego, I, I, I was the executive director of the United States Botanic Garden in Washington, DC. And um, there, there are some beginnings of some robust urban agriculture programs there, in particular with the school district, the, the, um, the school district of Washington, DC um, had uh, been really amazing and had even put rules in place saying all new school construction projects and even major renovations of schools would require school gardens and or greenhouses to be incorpor you know to be, to be included um, and that was really exciting because it created this resource for um, for teachers and students to, to to grow plants and they were very interested in growing edible plants so we, we ended up having an amazing dialogue with the teachers because it's great to have these, especially greenhouses, but the teachers are not working in the summer, which is the you know the period where your plants fry the fastest if nobody's paying attention to the greenhouse. Um, and you know, biology teachers were not necessarily um, educated on how to you know manage or run a greenhouse. And so um, I, I've long left, but that project really got some wings. And just last year, um, one of the fruits of that project was a, a school greenhouse operations manual. So so the, the U.S. Botanic Garden working with partners some of your institutions were involved as well, um, uh, you know, was able to publish a, a how-to manual of operating a greenhouse um, in a school and, and, and student setting, which was amazing. And to sort of relate that into the question about, you know, learning as you go, I think it's almost impossible not to have to be forced to learn as you go when you grow plants. You know, there's just no such thing as a foolproof plant growing system. You, you are, you know, one of the great things about trying to grow plants is nature is in charge and it, it finds ways, no matter how much new you know, no matter how much you've done, no matter how prepared or educated you are, it humbles you and forces you to, to roll with the punches of nature's diversity and, uh, and wins. Great. Thank you so much for that, Ari. Um, so we've heard a little bit about rainwater capturing. So, oh, sorry, go ahead, Ursula. Sorry, no, I just was going to jump in there, too. I just wanted to say, like, I was thinking about Morris Campus Educational Farm that we helped build at a high school campus. And I think what was really wonderful about that is so it's such a challenge, school gardens, like trying to I just feel like they're so often overextended, like there's not a staff person, it's supposed to be a, t a teacher who's like trying to do other time or, you know, there's just so many challenges um, for school gardens. And I think Morris Campus Educational Farm, it's still a challenge for them, but they were able to have a farm manager for that position. And then they just started a CTE program in agriculture actually this season, which is great. So they actually do have a teacher who's like working with the students. And it's so great that they have that outdoor farm space um, to work and to, you know, like, like I was saying, it's so important to have that space where they can just practice and experiment and like learn from their mistakes. And yeah, some seedlings they put in the, you know, the hoop house when it was too hot and maybe they didn't get watered or, you know, th that's just part of the process. And so I think um, just having a place where students can learn is so important. And then I also just wanted to say, and there's so many community members that have so much knowledge and expertise that they share with the younger generation and new gardeners as well and so just just wanting to like put that out there too like there's so much knowledge there's so much i've learned from our community partners and longtime gardeners who've had um, gardening and farming in their backgrounds that I've, I've learned from as well thank you so much for that ursula um i'm really glad that you were able to catch me before i moved on to the next question um i just we were having a lot of great questions coming in um so i'm going to move on to the next one um, we've heard about rainwater capturing systems um, in some of these community gardens and botanic gardens, but someone is wondering, um, are there any programs working with using gray water to irrigate gardens? I, I guess I get to do water questions, huh? Uh, so in California, like, you know, there's a rainbow of colors of water that we, we use. We, we use, you know, uh, gray water, purple water, and and then black water is untreated water. Um, gray, gray and purple water are very, very common um, to be used um, here in California. Um, and, you know, again, the challenge for us, and I think this is the big challenge in most um, arid climates, is that the water, the best water we have is already pretty salty. Um, and so both gray water and purple water get even saltier. Um, and so, you know, you, you, you start to deal with the physiological challenges of, um, of having that very high electrolyte water and which plants can, can handle that and which plants can't. There's a, you know, the, it, but it works. I mean, it absolutely works. And so you, 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 you mediate that both with your plant selection 
Um, so, you know, obviously, if you're in the worst case scenario, then you're growing date palms, you know, they, they can handle lots of salt uh, if, you, if you're tight enough and you can grow them. Um, and then there's there's a, another spectrum on the other side of things. And, all, and the second thing is your irrigation gets more complicated. So we can use pretty salty water. And then what we need to do is once a quarter or, or once every half year, depending on the soils and the water, we may need to flush the root zones of that field out with a higher quality water. So you sort of begin to have to have multiple water systems that deliver different qualities and types of water so that you can use the recycled, the various forms of recycled water more frequently, but occasionally come in with a higher quality of water to, to preserve the plant's ability to grow. And a, a quick toss on to that. Um, Colorado has the most complicated water law in the country. We are the headwaters of a very large part of it. So if rain or snow falls, hopefully one day again, um, and it comes down your drain spout, um, as soon as it hits the ground, you can't use it. So a home now legally can have one barrel and the size of the barrel is proscribed by law um, and you can collect that runoff, but anything after that belongs downstream wherever it may go. Um, so we just had uh, a law that enabled us to have a couple demonstrations and we're working with a community that has one of those demonstrations to law, uh, larger scale rain harvesting, but uh, we are trialing a, a product in our downtown gardens uh, that is a solar powered atmospheric water harvesting system. So it uses a solar panel to pull in outside air that goes through a desiccant and extracts purified water. And we have that connected to an irrigation panel that is powered by the solar system that then feeds a raised bed pizza garden right next to our pizza kitchen. And, and there's just things like that that are super exciting, thinking that we may be able to extract ourselves from the main kind of water infrastructure system, which is largely overly bureaucratic and in many ways corrupt, and just actually have our own autonomous uh, watering system. That's so interesting. I can't wait to look up more about that. Um, moving forward for the sake of time, um, we have another question. In what way could amendments to local, state, or federal policy contribute to urban agriculture and, and or are there any policies or regulations that currently impede any of your efforts? I think I could take this on from a local level here in Chicago. There's been actually quite a bit of progress over the last maybe 15 years um, in actually including urban agriculture into zoning. Um, and, and some of that has been very supportive. Some of it still needs improvements. I think one of the biggest areas is actually does connect to water. Um, the one of the issues um, in Chicago, which is quite ironic because we do have uh, one of the things we've got, we, we don't have a lot, but we've got a lot of water. Um, and, uh, and so one of the areas that, um, for example, urban agriculture is um, zoned here in commercial areas to be you know, a, a perfectly fine use of um, uh, zoning. And one of the issues is that there's no actual um, benefit to a farmer for, for capturing rainwater um, and absorbing it before it goes into our combined sewer system. So the sewer bills still need to be paid, um, which is, as you can imagine, a little bit of a high price. So I would imagine many cities have similar situations where it's like we're in progress, we're in process. Um, composting has also been kind of a little bit of a barrier here in the city limits, um, just as far as receiving um, offsite inputs to composting systems, which building soil is so critical. Um, so that's been something that we've been kind of like actively working with locally here on the ground. Just a couple of examples, but I think it varies, you know, city to city. Thank you so much for that, Kelly. Um, for the sake of time, there are a few more questions in the chat and we don't have time for them. So I will pose a last question that will hopefully help others be able to get those questions answered. Um, first, I wanna thank all of the panelists for their time. And before we sign off, the final question is, how can the audience get involved with or stay connected with your organizations? 
So if anyone, if everyone wants to go through and either if you have a, a volunteer program, direct us to your website or any social media handles we can follow. I think we're all very curious to learn more about that. Why don't we start with Ursula? I'm sure I was um, gonna put it in, I'll put it in afterwards, but I'll put in the chat our email direct to Bronxprina, but we have a monthly e-news that we send, to, send out that puts out our um, just community events that anyone is welcome to attend and participate in. And then we also have resources that we have in there as well. So we send that out monthly. And then we have the community work days that we do. You know, it's been less, but we hope to be doing them more with um, our different partners at community gardens and farms that we, you know, people are welcome to attend and join us to get different projects done. So um, yeah, then we just also have like different um, webinars, we've done these Bronx Food and Farm tours, and we have some, we did a lot virtually this past year and a half, so we have those virtually on our website, we have more about the Bronx Food Farm Hub, so we have different, um, if you're interested, there are different videos that are available that you can check out as well, and also hands-on videos about like um, different topics such as starting seeds and incorporating compost, planting cover crops, so we have stuff like that as well, and I'll, I'll put it the, the in the chat. Thank you so much, Ursula. Um, Brian, how can we stay more involved? I think you're muted, Brian. Uh, sorry about that. I hate it when I do that. Um, uh, looking at the list of people that signed up for today, I, I think they're at least three states away from Denver. Uh, we're, I feel a bit of like an island out here, but should you be in the Rocky Mountain West, and uh, want to connect with us, it's just botanicgardens.org is our website. There's all kinds of volunteer opportunities and engagement opportunities. And if anybody's out there developing programs and they would just like to brainstorm a little bit with one of our urban food initiatives team, um, I'm happy to hook them up. Uh, my email address is votebvogtb v -O -G -T -B, at botanicgardens.org. Um, and we'd love to welcome you here in Colorado, should you be out this way. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, Ari, how can people stay more involved? Uh, I'm, I'll be happy to put our, you know, uh, stuff in the chat. Um, in my, my personal email, you can email me and, and I'll also just say, come visit us. Um, we're pretty active on social media, um, particularly Instagram and Facebook. So that's probably if you're that kind of person. Um, the best way to do it. And, uh, and we just look forward to continued dialogue. So thank you. Thank you so much. And last but not least, Kelly. Yeah, I'll drop in the chat our website as well. I feel I, I didn't see any Chicago people in the list, but uh, if you're ever in Chicago, you can come visit our farm, uh, our food hub. It's called Farm on Ogden, um, where we have a grocery store and aquaponic system and teaching kitchen and kind of aggregate produce from all of our farms and from our incubators. Um, but check out our website, I'll drop it in the chat. Um, we did work with the US Botanic Garden on a, a guide uh, for urban agriculture. So I dropped that in earlier and I'll put my email in as well if anyone wants to connect. And then if you're, as Ari said, an Instagram person or Facebook and all that, we have, we're just at Windy City Harvest. Um, so we post pretty regularly, random fun things. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much to all of our panelists for this engaging discussion, for taking the time to come together. Um, I'll also do a quick shout out to the American Public Gardens Association, which um, brings public garden leaders and people like myself who are just passionate about gardens together. There's all kinds of resources. You can become a member. There's professional development opportunities. There's all kinds of resources. And they have a food and agriculture committee if you are interested in getting more involved. And so um, if this is something you're passionate about, connect with your local public garden, but um, also uh, be, come join uh, the broader coalition of public gardens that are focusing on these issues. So um, thank you to our panelists for sharing your knowledge and to Agri Agritecture today for hosting us um, and making this possible. And um, look forward to seeing all of you at a garden sometime soon and have a wonderful and safe holiday season. Thank you.